Sorry, we are back for our third and last panel for our conference today on topic culture, education, and new research. I will be starting. I'm Maria Kaliambu, and my research uh, combines folklore and ethnology with literature, book history, and diaspora studies. Also, I'm interested in foreign language pedagogy, particularly teaching modern Greek. My current project is on the book culture of Greek Americans, and my paper today is about the representations of the Greek Revolution in Greek American publications of the 20th century. And now I will share my PowerPoint with you. Um, wait. Um, And here is, yeah. So reviving the revolution in Greek American publications. In Greek America, almost every child is dressed as Evzonaki, as we've heard so far, the traditional costume of the Greek soldier. According to Helen Papanikolas, I quote, it was rare for a son of Greek immigrant parents to get through childhood without having his picture taken in the fustanella, this traditional skirt. And the photograph is taken by Helen Papanikolas' book, Here is a Boy in the 1930s in Salt Lake City area. The image of the Greek little soldier is sold also as a gift in bookstores in New York. Here on the left side, you see the price catalog, the title page of the price catalog of the bookstore Atlas from the year 1938-39. And on the right side, we see that the bookstore advertises those Greek soldiers you see here in the middle, those Greek soldiers as the best memory of home as they advertise it sold for $2.5. Also girls on the right side in the traditional costumes are sold as the most beautiful gift. And on the bottom, you see this traditional tsaruhakia. These are for little kids. These are these uh, traditional shoes with an upturned toe uh, with a pompon on top. The Greek, uh, this little Greek boy, the Greek soldier appears also in school books. Here we have the first Greek American reading book written by Venetia Vidali, published in 1935 by the publisher National Herald in New York. On the left, you see the cover of the school book. And on the right side, the author illustrates the letter E, Epsilon, Elinopoulo, with this Greek child uh, dressed in this traditional skirt. And the subtitle reads, in a Yamato So the Greek child is full of braveness, which adds a triumphant tone to the image of being Greek. So besides this above school book, in what other publications can we find representations of the Greek revolution? Is there a main narrative throughout those representations of the revolution at the beginning of the 20th century? My material, my analysis focuses on three categories poetry collections, drama productions, and historical texts in school books for the elementary school. I will demonstrate the role these textual representations of the revolution play toward the historical awareness and the identity formation of Greek Americans. So let me start with poetry. The first poetry collection is written by Dimitrios Vallakos with the title Songs of Foreign Lands, published in 1912 in New York by the publisher D.C. Divry. His poem, March 25th, is a hymn to the revolution. Uh, the title March 25th refers to the starting day of the revolution, as we know, as we've said already, it's to, still today, the national holiday. This poem is an epitome of all the circulated stereotypes Greek Americans internalize about the revolution. The poet compares the Greek revolution with Christ's resurrection. And I quote, such magnificent second resurrection the world has not seen since our Christ glorious one. Valakos refers also to two emblematic figures. The first figure is Constantine Paleologos, the last Byzantine emperor who received legendary dimensions in people's minds and is widely imprinted in folk traditions. 
The folk legend wants him to be alive. He's petrified in his palace, waiting the resurrection, the freedom of his kingdom. The second uh, mentioned personality in this poem is Lord Byron. We've heard about Lord Byron today, the English passionate Phil Helene, who came to Greece, I quote as the, the poet, wearing tsaruhia and fustanella, these traditional shoes and the skirt, and goes to the battle like the brave Suliotes. And Byron wanted Messolonghi to become his eternal home where he actually died. Also, the poet here does not forget antiquity. He concludes by saying that with the revolution, I quote, the first ancient glory will be resurrected again together with all Greece's beautiful ideals. To some, this 1912 poem by Greek American in America combines ancient glory, Byzantine legends, Philhellene support, all geared towards the resurrection of the nation. I move to the next uh, uh, poetry collection edited by Vasilios Zustis, published in 1917 in New York with the title Hellenic Muses. The book includes religious, patriotic, militant, heroic, and love poems by Greek immigrants in America. As the editor Zustis notes at the preface, Greeks who were successful not only in their professions as merchants, laborers, etc., but also, I quote, they served the muses, the letters, the arts, and the sciences, end of quote. Several poems of this collection are devoted to the heroic behavior and the patriotism Greeks demonstrated during the revolution. For instance, this uh, poem, The Marching Song of Suliotes and Vatirion Sulioton by Liaskas from Yanena, encourages that all men, women, and even children should throw stones from the mountains against the Turks. Suliotes, as we know, the title, uh, remain known for their bold resistance to the Ottoman rule. So this poem is an homage to the selflessness and the self-sacrifice of the Greeks. I move to my second category, the theater performances. Helen Papanikolas informs us that in the 1920s and 30s, theater plays were produced on the theme of the Greek-Turkish war and given on March 25th, the anniversary of the revolution, the revolt. In Carbon County, the girl students of the Greek schools took all parts. In Salt Lake City, the adults were the actors. And here on the screen, we have a photograph of an adult theater group of a performance in Salt Lake City in the 1930s. The play here, uh, Helias Danetis, published in 1918 in Sp Springfield, Massachusetts, the theater play Martyrs and Avengers, a patriotic drama in four acts. Uh, very briefly about this theater play, it talks about the secret society of friends, the massacres of heroes, the abduction of young girls and boys by the Ottomans, and it has a happy ending at the end by the reunion of a family, of a family which lost its children. Zanettis writes in the preface of the second edition that this play was taught, I quote, very successfully by amateur theater groups and by school students, and it was performed in several group, Greek diasporic communities in America and in Greece, Smyrna, Romania, Cyprus, and elsewhere. Indeed, throughout the pages, there are several images of the actors who played in the play. And here you see the heroine Urania, who was captured by Turks and sold as a slave in Constantinople, but she was finally saved by her fiance, a member of the Secret Society of Friends. And I was very intrigued by this uh, theater play because it is uh, played in New Haven, Connecticut, where Yale Hellenic Studies is located. So I thought here where I am in the 1930s, they were playing this um, uh, drama uh, about the Secret Society and the revolution. Or another, um, uh, another production here, a theater group in Springfield, Massachusetts. Here we see another actor, the elderly priest Agapius, who was threatened to be decapitated by the Turks, 
but was saved by the young man, again, member of the Society of Friends. So these are productions um, uh, by adults. So motifs such as the abduction of young boys and girls, the priest who is threatened to die of a brutal death, the inconsolable parents, the devotion to religion in Greece, the self-sacrifice of the members of the Society of Friends, etc. All of those refer to martyr-like experiences. As the saints who suffered greatly and died of brutal deaths and became martyrs of Christ, similarly, Greek men and women of the revolution are the neo-martyrs of modern time. I would like to show you now a book which, is, which includes a theater plays for children. What we've seen so far was theater for adults. Nikolaos Vavoudis publishes in 1937 the drama play, The Hero of Alamana is the second on the row, Hero of Alamana, a play about the legendary fighter Athanasios Viakos, whose heroic acts and horrific death of impalement reached mythic dimensions in folk memory and tradition. Uh, let me very briefly comment on the last act of this play, which is placed in contemporary society. People offer wreaths to the monument of Athanasios Diakos honoring his legacy. Among them, there is also a Greek American, and I quote, an original idea of the author in order to give an American touch to the patriotism. So the author includes also Greek Americans in this uh, revolutionary play. The author emphasizes that Greeks from all over the world are grateful to the hero Diakos because Diakos taught them that freedom and honor are better than life itself. Notably, the, this play is full of well-known slogans from folk songs that we all learn at school and we sing. For instance, Yades Keropu Dialexe, or here you see it includes the most emblematic song, Thurios by Rigas, the battle song, so better and our freedom rather than 40 years of slave, which you see here, and it is printed also with this in musical annotation. And I move fast to my last uh, um, uh, group, the, the school books, the historical accounts in some school books. Nikolaos Vavoudis also wrote the school book with the emblematic title, The Palaces of My Fatherland, the Patricamo Palatia, for the fourth and fifth grade of the elementary schools. The book has chapters about general knowledge, religion, history, and grammar. A chapter titled The Continuation of the Glory, a patriotic reading, is meant to educate uh, young children about the revolution. And these are the main topics children learn about the revolution. And you can see those on the screen. It's about the holiday, about the patriarch and his ending, about the bandits, the secret school, uh, the heroism of Suliotes, massacres, uh, the support by foreigners, etc. and Rigas Ferreos. The children learn about the tyranny of the Ottomans, the free spirit of the Greeks, and their heroic battles. Students also learn to sing well-known folk songs about the secret school and heroes such as Diakos and Constantine, thus rendering the historical content into a performance. And Febronia Sumakis, we're gonna listen to her later, she mentions that in the Greek school system, I quote, the slavery narrative was impressed upon students at an early age. Even on the walls, Greek revolutionary heroes adorn classrooms, bulletin boards, and hallways. So the above school book reflects the ideology of the glorification of heroism. And I come to my preliminary uh, conclusions. After this brief showcase of the Greek American books at the first half of the 20th century, the question that arises is what parts of the history of the revolution do Greek Americans choose to represent in these publications? What are the main recurring themes in their narratives? In other words, what do Greeks in America learn about the revolution and the formation of the Greek state? A, I argue that uh, the historical knowledge about the revolution is segmented through random historical references, accurate or not. 
For instance, there is some information about the beginning of the revolution, about Rigas Ferreos, the Society of Friends, the events in Agia Lavra Monastery, when Paleon Patron Germanos raised the flag and officially started the revolution. So some information about the beginning. Also, there are references about the secret school, Krifos Holio, and the heroic acts of the bandits and clefts. B, there is an emphasis to the descriptions of humiliating and brutal deaths of heroes, such as the decapitation of Patriarch Gregorius and the impalement of Athanasius Diakos. Those two are kept in collective memory through their horrible deaths and represent heroes with almost supernatural strength. Their stories blend reality and fantasy. They function as the neo-martyrs, as I mentioned, who inspire, move, and ignite personal pride. And C, the self-sacrifice of Greeks as it is exemplified by the women Suliotises and the inhabitants of Mesolongi is bold underlined. These heroes function as role models and inspire the new generations of Greeks in America. The heroic actions by eponymous or anonymous people create a continuous charged genealogy of glorious ancestors who fascinate and must be imitated. All the above narratives have the tendency to exaggerate. Additionally, their performance, singing or acting makes them even more memorable. These stories oscillate between history and mythology. In fact, they create their own mythology about the revolution. Societies need selective glorious myths to feel proud of their ancestors. Moreover, for the Greeks in diaspora, this story carry one more additional quality, that of connecting with a beloved but lost home. They can replace the cut and broken umbilical cord. Thus, they have an existential weight to the historical awareness of the Greeks in diaspora. And with this, I thank you so much for your patience. All right, I hope you liked it, yeah. And, and I move to our next uh, speaker, uh, Fevronia Sumakis. Fevronia holds a PhD in history and education from Teachers College, Columbia University. Fevronia currently teaches in the Modern Greek program at Queens College, CUNY. Her research interests include the history of education, immigration and ethnicity, and religion and education. Her next book project examines the history of Greek American women, education, and philanthropy in the 20th century. Her talk today has a title, Celebrating the 1971 Greek Independence Day Jubilee through Greek Orthodox schools in the United States. Fevronia, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria, um, for the invitation to participate and share some uh, preliminary thoughts on my ongoing research. Uh, thank you to the panelists uh, for sharing your research today and for participating in this dialogue. And of course, to the audience who is um, sticking it out uh, with us uh, to the end. I very much appreciate it. Maria, just a quick question. I just want to make sure that you um, only see my, my PowerPoint slide right now. Yes, it is great. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. <clears throat> and I only have two slides uh, to share with you today. On March 28, 1971, Ekaterini Apostolou Mikhopoulou, a fourth grade Greek American student uh, of the Greek Orthodox Church of the Holy Trinity School located in Tulsa, Oklahoma, read aloud a short essay she wrote in Greek in celebration of Greek Independence Day. In her speech, she made references to Greeks living as free people due to the sacrifices of her ancestors. She points to the fact that Greece, while being small in size, fought communism and atheism. Ekaterini felt that everyone should be proud of their two mothers, America and Greece, urging all uh, present to proclaim, long live America, long live Greece. And this is just a paraphrase of her essay. 
uh, that I'm going to share with you in this next oops, slide. Ekaterini's essay, her classmates' essay, the school program, and a photo commemorating the event were collected by the priest of Holy Trinity, the very Reverend George Thomas. These items were sent along to the Department of Education at the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of North and South America in New York. The director of the Education Department, Mr. Emmanuel Hadzi Manuel, upon the request from the Greek Ministry of Education, had asked all the parish communities under the archdiocese to collect their uh, celebration material and photos and send them to him or directly to the Greek Ministry of Education. Those materials would be compiled into a special anniversary publication with the title, The Contribution of the Greek Children Abroad to the 150 Year Anniversary of the Revolution of 1821. And I'm going to take you through the images on this slide. <clears throat> Ekaterini's essay, the production and compilation of materials, the coordination of the broader school programs under the Archdiocese's Department of Education, and the interests of the Greek Ministry of Education at this time reflect the paramount significance of celebrating the Greek War of Independence in Greek schools and the collaboration between the Archdiocese and the schools in the US. But why and what was the purpose? Alexander Kicharov has argued, and I quote, that the Greek Orthodox Church in America has shaped Greek American identity by adapting to the steady Americanization of the Greek Americans, end quote. Thus, Greek Orthodox schools, as part of the broader multiplicity of functions of church communities, served as spaces for shaping Greek American identity in school children. Their purpose was to instill knowledge of the Greek language, culture, religion, and Greek history, and in doing so, to reinforce the significance of the church in everyday life. Thus, March 25th was a time devoted to celebrating both the Greek Revolution and the Feast of the Annunciation within the space of a Greek Orthodox school in a Greek Orthodox church in America. Commemorative events are considered social and political acts, according to John Gillis, which involve, and I quote, the coordination of individual and group memories whose results may appear consensual when they are in fact the product of processes of intense contest, struggle, and in some instances, annihilation, end quote. And so my work today draws from archival sources that include school materials produced by the Archdiocese's Department of Education, school programs and curricula, teachers and clergy correspondence, press releases, and newspaper articles. And over the next few minutes, uh, I'm going to use the images on this slide, um, and I aim to show that the celebratory pageants in Greek schools emphasize predictable themes, uh, things that we've been uh, hearing uh, throughout the day today, namely the contributions of the church and clergy to the revolution, a reproduction of a nationalist narrative of Greek history, and an emphasis on Philhellenes who supported the Greek struggle. I argue that these traditional thematic elements along with their symbolic manifestations as expressed in the Greek schools should be understood in light of a Greek Orthodox Church pushing for visibility in the American mainstream at the height of the civil, civil rights movement and during a time when the military dictatorship was in power in Greece during the period 1967 to 1974. Celebrating the Jubilee anniversary of the Greek Revolution in Greek Orthodox schools in 1971 was a social and political event which amplified nationalism, religiosity, and the notion of uninterrupted historical continuity. It was as much a conservative exercise in nationalistic sentiment as it was a shaping of Greek American identity along American racial lines. In anticipation of the 150 year celebration, Archbishop Iakovos sent formal announcements to Greek Orthodox communities in the Western hemisphere. In his announcement dated February 20th, 1971, he drew attention to what he called the underlying forces which contributed to the successful outcome of a gallant struggle. And these forces included, first and foremost, the contribution of the church, which nourished the enslaved nation with heroic visions, 
now in the narthex of the church, then in the schoolrooms provided by the wealthy. Other forces included the conscience of the nation, the bravery of the people, the altruism of the Philhellenes. The notion of slavery, uh, in fact, the word slavery was raised at least five times in his writing. The archbishop elaborated upon these ideals in his encyclical dated March 25th, the anniversary of the Greek revolution, but shifted and focused more on the dignity of man, which could not be sustained in an era of, he wrote, exploitation, discrimination, and social injustice. And while the Archbishop clearly places the church at the center, he also incorporates language which is characteristic of the civil rights movement. The ideals of freedom, self-respect, and equality, which have very much been compromised by exploitation, discrimination, and social injustice. The Department of Education, under the director, Emmanuel Hudson Emanuel, put together an education toolkit titled 150 Years of Freedom and sent it to all the Greek schools to aid them in their preparations. And the second image on the top row um, shows the cover of the education toolkit. I, want, I would like to add as well that in the academic year 1970 to 1971, there were 409 Greek schools with an enrollment of nearly 25,000 students and 550 teachers. And there were um, 18 parochial schools operating in the US, Canada, and South America. Not surprising, the education toolkit mirrored via its school materials, the ideas referenced in the archbishops and cyclicals. And as you can see in the third image on the top row, the church takes center stage as a guardian of education. Uh, this image is from the front cover of the Department of Education school materials and features the secret schools, something that we've raised today. Uh, you see a group of children gathered around a, ca a candle with a book being directed by an elderly priest. Other materials included poems, skits, and articles for use in the schools. What makes this education toolkit interesting is that there were materials available in English an acknowledgement of the growing Americanization of Greek Americans. English materials focus especially on American support for the Greek Revolution of 1821. In fact, Hudson Emanuel himself compiled excerpts of writings and speeches from prominent uh, Americans, such as James Monroe, John, John Quincy Adams, and Daniel Webster, uh, each one conveying his support for the struggling Greeks and their heroic cause. In his introduction to these excerpts, Hudson Emanuel characterized the relationship between the Americans and Greeks as natural allies, since the Americans themselves had gone through the ordeal of liberty in order to realize the destiny which had already been ordained uh, to them. For all the lofty rhetoric uh, that prevailed during the course of the celebrations, one cannot help but question the use of a slogan and image that gestured to the dictatorship that was in power in Greece. In the fourth and fifth images on the top row, we see the front cover and the invitation to a celebratory program hosted by the Archdiocese's Department of Education and the Council of Education, which was an advisory board to the Archdiocese. The program in the lower right uh, hand corner uses the word rebirth in its Greek translation rather than um, eletheria, an idea that was co-opted by the dictatorship at the time to underscore and rationalize their existence. The invitation has an image of a bird with extended wings, just like the upper left hand corner of the education toolkit in image number two, that is akin to the mythical phoenix uh, that was also co-opted by the dictatorship, uh, but does not include the flames and the soldier. The public nature of the program held at the Fordham University Auditorium in Lincoln Center in New York City, again, featured prayers, speeches, music, and dramatizations. How did the Archbishop's framework for understanding the Greek Revolution and the Department of Education's toolkit all map out onto the Greek schools? Well, when we look at some of the work done in the schools, we find, uh, once again, the same amplification of nationalism, religiosity, and historical continuity. 
We also find an understanding of a special relationship or bond between Greeks and Americans. And as you can see in the lower half of the slide, I have included two March 25th school programs flanking the central photograph. On the left is a two page program from the Haverhill, Massachusetts school community. In the center, we see a photo of the governor of Maryland, uh, Marvin Mandel, presenting a proclamation to the Reverend George Papadimitriou of the Annapolis, Maryland community. And the last uh, two images are of the Charlottesville, Virginia school program, uh, which is rendered nearly entirely in English. How can we make sense of all of this today? On the 200 year anniversary of the Greek Revolution, it is important to tackle the difficult issues in history and to challenge our understanding and teaching of national pasts. Ekaterini's essay, uh, which I started my talk off with, reflects her Greek school education. She learned to read and to write in Greek and fair, fairly well. Uh, she adopted the language of historical continuity of the dichotomy that presents Greeks as good and others as evil. She fused her hybrid identity of two homelands, America and Greece, the new and the old, both embodying the ideals of freedom and democracy. Ideals, however, which were not fully realized by citizens of all countries, of both countries rather. By continuing to emphasize these themes, Greek schools accommodated a narrow understanding of freedom. The paradox of celebrating 150 years of freedom through education, um, I'm sorry, through education while Greece was ruled by a military dictatorship was a missed opportunity by the Department of Education. It was an opportunity to make authentic claims regarding freedom and democracy but instead reflected an accommodation in, uh, accommodationist stance through their use of those symbols in their materials. It was also a missed opportunity to become true allies of minority rights and the African-American cause, especially through education. This, this work in my preliminary thinking, which looks at the Greek American diaspora through the lens of the Greek schools affirms Anna Karpathakis's and Victor Rudomatov's assertion regarding the telling of the Americanized Hellenic narrative that places Greek Americans into the upper echelons of the American racial structure. My work today challenges educators to think more critically about the continued use of this regressive narrative in Greek schools and the values it promotes to look to the past to inform their work and to transform the shaping of Greek American identity for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Fevronia. This was very interesting talk and actually you enter a taboo terrain of the school books <clears throat> and uh, the years, the forbidden years. Thank you. We're, gonna, we're eager to see how your research evolves. And now I'm moving to our last speaker, Yorgos Anagnostou. Yorgos Anagnostou is the Miltiadis Marinakis Professor of Modern Greek Language and Culture at the Ohio State University. His research interests include diaspora and American ethnic studies with a focus on Greek America. Among other things, Yorgos is the editor of the online journal Ergon, Greek American Arts and Letters, which features Greek American scholarship, poetry, and essays. Yorgos' talk has the title The Bicentenary Across Greece and the Diaspora Toward the Making of a Global Greek Civic Identity. Yorgo, thank you for being here, and the screen is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, I thank Maria Kalyabu for organizing this conference and the institutions supporting it. Uh, this is an important conversation. Uh, I, I undertook this work specifically for the purpose of this conference, so it is at a very preliminary stage. My aim today is to foreground a particular facet of the bicentenary, namely those narratives which draw from the Greek revolution to envision a future for Greek identity. I will be explaining why I was motivated to take up this topic 
and why I believe it is of major importance for Greece and the various Greek diasporas. My point of departure is a particular attribute shared by most types of national commemorations. Namely, they operate with three dimensions of social time simultaneously. National commemorations mark ritual time in the present to reflect about the past and envision the future. They orient themselves towards the past to remember or debate historical events, figures, and values and they position themselves forward to the future to project and debate goals or visions for the nation's becoming. National commemorations then bring the present, the past, and the future into conversation. The Greek bicentenary is not an exception to this temporal logic. In her inaugural speech, the president of Greece 2021 committee indeed frames the bicentenary as a moment, I quote, to determine not just where we are, but also where we want to go. End of quote. It is this question of where we want to go that motivates my work. The stakes in this question are high for both Greece and the Greek diasporas. The trajectory of Greece's future takes place in the context of a rapidly changing demographic environment where national belonging intertwines with legal and cultural questions about the place of people such as immigrants and the children in the polity. The making of identity in the various Greek diasporas is also politically urgent and not merely around the question of ethnic survival. As multiracial democracies are confronted with social movements demanding equal civic belonging for disenfranchised groups, the question arises about the position of the of Greek diaspora institutions and people vis-a-vis -vis these political demands. How does the future Greek diaspora identity envision its relations with the disenfranchised fellow citizens and residents? You notice that I pose the question in terms of identity. I raise it in terms of identity because identity is more than an act of defining the self. It implicitly or explicitly positions the self in relation to others. As John Gillis puts it, I quote, every assertion of identities involves a choice that affects not just ourselves, but others. End of quote. When European immigrant groups in the United States, for example, claim that they experience mobility through their hard work alone, they disregard the adverse impact that racism had on the mobility of others. And in doing so implicitly and unfairly blame those others for the lack of mobility. Narratives about the self implicate others. This connection between the self and others is my point of entry into the conversation about the making of identity in the bicentenary. I turn my attention therefore to a corpus of narratives which brings together the revolutionary period, the bicentenary, the future of Greek identity and a broad range of others significantly people who have no direct connection with the revolution. I explore this corpus in three contexts, namely Greece and two diasporas, Greek Australia and Greek America. The authors who produce this narrative share a common interest. They answer the question about the future of Greek identity by looking into the encounters of Greek people, both in Greece and the diaspora, with vulnerable populations such as refugees, immigrants, people of color, and colonized indigenous populations, among others. I show that all versions of the narrative in this corpus converge in their call for a Greek identity in alliance with these vulnerable demographics. This commonality creates a cohesive civic narrative, which I call the global Greek civic identity narrative. I refer to it as a global simply because it is produced in various geopolitical locations in the world. 
but I do not theorize or explore the sociology or philosophy of world citizenship. And I refer to civic identity because it involves active participation with public issues affecting a political community such as the nation state. My first example is an essay by Professor Dimitris Christopoulos, it was published in 2021, both in English and uh, Greek, who singles out the first provisional revolutionary constitution voted by the National Assembly, Assembly of Epidavros on January 1st, 1822, as a prism to reflect on citizenship practices in modern Greece. I quote, as the most robust birthright citizenship law Greece has ever known, he writes, the Epidaurus constitution calls to re-examine Greece's version of we, the people. And this in the context of the country's multi-ethnic and multi-racial presence. Uh, he asks, do we consider the children of the immigrants members of the Greek nation? Do we want them in our polity? Who do we want to be? after all. The birthright legal principle of the revolutionary era, whose cycle ended in 1835, presents a legacy Christop Christopoulos advocates to be adopted and adapted for the current circumstances of a multi-ethnic Greece. And while in fact the legal framework has been shifting since 2015 towards an inclusive birthright ideology, the place of naturalized immigrants and their children in the nation is still contested. Will those immigrants who are conferred the legal rights of citizenship be rendered as equally Greek in the national imaginary? The question remains about the necessary political arrangements and cultural mechanisms for this kind of inclusion. In my second example, the ideology of civic equality between Greek people and non-ethnic Greeks finds expression in the work of historian Andonis Piperoglou. His position paper calls readers to situate the 2021 Greek-Australian bicentenary in relation to two unrelated historical contexts, the successful Greek revolution against an empire and the subjugation of Australian Aborigines by a colonial power. A relative commonality between the Greek people and the indigenous Australians in, the, in, the, in this context is the shared collective memory of being second-class imperial and colonial subjects. A difference between the two is that the latter continues to be subjected to the legacies of white settler colonialism. Piperoglou draws from the 1988 centennial of Australia to remind us that the nation's celebration displayed insensitivity and disrespect for the plight of indigenous people during the making of British Australia. A people's celebration for, its, for the nation state uh, formation failed to account for another people's mourning around the same event. In contrast, the Australian governing authorities highly respected the 2021 Greek bicentenary by celebrating the Greeks as a model white ethnic group. This privileging reproduces racial hierarchies, the author notes. The official narrative did not attempt to show how colonial histories benefited the European settler immigrants at the expense of indigenous people. What is then the ethical and political responsibility of a post-imperial diaspora group towards fellow citizens still caught within the hierarchies of settler colonialism? Hence, the historians call for the Greek diaspora to recontextualize the bicentenary beyond the question of national remembering. The Greek Australians historical remembering ought to consider the paragroup leads not only the Greek national past, but also the Greek immigrant past and its collusion with Australian, Australia's colonial settlement project. The recognition that the immigrant settlers benefited by participating in the colonial dispossession of native lands raises the ethical imperative for the bicentenary to acknowledge this, this historical fact and contest racial hierarchies. In the United States, scholars writing about Greek America similarly connect the history of the Greek revolution with histories of colonialism and racism at home. 
Two recent pieces advance this conversation, namely Artemis Leontis' essay, Visiting the Statue of Ypsilanti in Michigan on Martin Luther King's Junior Day, and Thomas Tom, Scal Tom Galland's lecture from Orphan to Abolitionist, Photius Fisk and the Making of Greek America. Both presentations were uh, published and delivered in the context of uh, honoring the African American Month. Both scholars, Leontis and Galland, connect their subject matter in various degrees with the Greek Revolution. Leontis centers her reflection on the history of Woodruff's Grove, an American settlement in Michigan, which was renamed in Ypsilanti in 1825, thanks to an initiative by local American Philhellenes. Dimitrios Ypsilantis was a prominent figure in the Greek Revolution, and its statue in the, in the town today serves as a gathering place for Greek Americans in their annual commemoration of Greek independence. Leontis' historical probing brings into the conversation the first nations originally inhabiting the region. She shows that local agents of Philhellenism were also agents of regional colonialism who participated and capitalized on the dispossession of indigenous people from their ancestral lands. Leontis brings home the realization that the, the Philhellenism connected with the history of the town cannot be divorced from colonial land politics and racial hierarchies. And here I make a gesture to make a connection with uh, what Costis Corellis mentioned about um, American Philhellenes, Philhellenes in the American South. It is instructive to bring this history that uh, Leontis evolves in relation to the present. Aside honoring the Greek revolution and liberty today is historically implicated with colonial settler capitalism and the oppression of native peoples. In other words, this site, a place of celebratory ethnic commemoration for a people is also a place of historical injustices inflicted on others. What is it then that the Greek Americans celebrate when they exalt field Hellenism in Ypsilanti? The question is ethical and political, resonating with the Greek Australian predicament. How to commemorate an event significant for a people in a place associated with other people's plight? My last example is Tom Galland's webinar, which focuses on Photius Fisk born in 1806, died in 1890, 1890. A figure born in the island of Hydra and sponsored in 1823 by American missionaries to attend the Cornwall School in Massachusetts. Tracing Fisk's uh, multiple journeys, experiences, beliefs, and commitments, Galland illuminates a series of his dramatic self-transformations from a Greek Orthodox to a Congregationalist, from a reverend to a free thinker, from a newcomer in New England to a renowned Greek American abolitionist. Born Photius Cavasalis, Fisk became an ordained minister who joined the Revolutionary Greek Navy after the Battle of Navarino to only quickly turn a wall absent without leave before committing himself to the abolitionist movement, civil rights activism, lobbying to end flog flogging in the US Navy, Navy where he served as a chaplain and anti-poverty causes, including philanthropy in Greece. Fisk represents a Greek American subject who navigates two worlds, being enmeshed in Phil Hellenism, philanthropy, and political activism at home. His identity entails a process of becoming. In this respect, his example serves as a reminder of the multiple commitments of a diaspora subject whose priorities and patriotism do not necessarily privilege the historical homeland, but selectively incorporate it. A civic identity centers his Greek American life and identity. In conclusion, all narratives I discuss advocate inclusive and equit equitable modes of civic belonging, both within Greece and the diaspora. The question of Greek identity is raised in ethical political terms. Who the Greeks are as a people is intimately interwoven who, with how they position themselves in relation to structures of inequality and exclusion in their home countries. They purposefully express a commitment to multiracial democracy in Greece and the homes of the diaspora. In doing so, 
they reframe the scope of the commemoration from a nation-centric celebration to a reflection about the Greek people's past and the deliberation about the ethical and political responsibilities of civic belonging. The global Greek civic identity narrative advocates historical learning about the home societies as well as encounters of Greek people with others as a necessary feature of the future of Greek identity. I will skip here some paragraphs where I locate this civic identity in a wide range of contested representations from the nationalist representations that we spoke about to in many ways, um, the narrative of American Philhellenism, which is utilized, instrumentalized to use Alexander Kitraev's term for the purposes of public diplomacy to strengthen the cultural and political relations between the United States. And also, of course, another narrative is the work of historians who have contributed enormously about the learning, relearning, and recontextualizing the history of the revolution. My aim in this talk was to foreground a narrative whose importance, I believe, warrants greater attention from what it has received. And I should also mention that this narrative is not exclusively embraced by scholars and academics. It is practiced both in Greek America and Greece and Greek Australia. Examples include the North America Archdiocese official support of the Black Lives Matter in 2020, Brooklyn State Senator Adriel Kurnardis' call for a new legacy of the Greek American community in the 21st century premised on the community's collective support of the refugees, and in Greek Australia, the Greek community of Melbourne's uh, solidarity with Australian Aborigines. And also I should mention uh, that this Greek civic identity narrative I outlined contributes to a broader initiative which links the bicentennial of the Greek revolution with the active reshaping of Hellas through emergent, emancipatory, and creative forms of belonging under the rubric of decolonized Hellas. In closing, my concluding paragraph, for modern Greek studies, the geopolitical diversity in the construction of the Greek civic narrative calls for conversation across national contexts and the diasporas, inviting comparative projects whose theorization presents formidable challenges. The landscape is vastly complex, involving discrepant histories and national specificities, both across the various diasporas and their home nation states, as well as across each of the diasporas in Greece. One of the challenges is to move beyond the mere plea for empathy as a civic obligation and examine it in connection, in con in connection to questions of governance and institutional activism. What political arrangements, for instance, could reconcile, say, one's empathy for indigenous people and a firm commitment to national integration on the one hand and an indigenous people's demands for cultural and territorial rights on the other? How does one engage with those Greek Americans who express hostility and disdain for Black Lives Matter? And if I could connect this point with the point that was repeatedly made today that in many ways we have to revise the national narrative, we have to challenge these assumptions, we have to uh, foreground and perform uh, marginalized narratives and perspectives. It is wonderful that we are identifying the need for intervention but I think the next step is to think how about to negotiate the hegemonies that have been sustaining the dominant narrative for over a century. I mean, listening to Maria Kalyabus's presentation about the 1930s, one could make the argument that many of the themes are still relevant today. Uh, they're still circulating and reinforced today. So in many ways, we're speaking about a formidably power narrative that I think we need to, to focus our intellectual energies to think about how does one engage with this hegemony. And I believe that in our efforts, uh, we need to find a language to facilitate communication across the academy uh, with both activists and communities for the purpose of empowering the Greek civic narrative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Yorgo. Uh, thank you for this opening of the conversation toward global perspectives and, and including two major diasporas, the Greek American, Greek Canadian and the Greek Australia. 
And thank you also for those close readings of those texts uh, of this, uh, um, how and how can we reflect on the new production of identity. So we're gonna take one, two or three maximum questions because time is, um, yes, time, as I said, is it's too late and maybe you are very tired. So I see a question for Febronia. Uh, by Professor Angelo, Angelos Palikidis, Professor of History of Education at the Democritus University of Thrace. I will read the question, Febronia, for you. Greek dictators considered themselves as descendants of the militants of the Greek Revolution and therefore carried out spectacular celebrations, including schools. Do you have any clue um, that the Greek dictatorship propaganda affected diaspora in the US? Again, by Professor Palikidis. Uh, thank you so much. That's a, that's a, that's a great question, uh, Agile. Um, we are colleagues, and I'm, I'm glad that you were able to join us today. Um, I do want to share this question uh, with Alexander Kicherev, if, if that's OK, uh, given that he has uh, recently published a chapter on um, uh, the Greek Orthodox Church and the military dictatorship in a recently published edited volume by Katarina Lagos. And Othon Anastasakis. Um, I can say that, um, and I think Alexander brought this up earlier in his talk, that um, uh, representatives of the military dictatorship um, in the consulates and at the embassy were invited to all of these celebratory pageants. Um, I do have evidence of um, letters of invitation to the ambassador to attend the um, uh, uh, 1971 celebration in, in uh, Ford the Fordham University Auditorium at Lincoln Center. Uh, the extent to which that propaganda, um, the larger propaganda and ideas infiltrated the schools, I can speak a little more closely about the schools. Um, Books that were produced during the dictatorship, according to uh, one of my colleagues and their research, did make their way to the schools here, um, perhaps a little later on, not immediately in, in, in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, and I know from um, Ted Zervis's work that by the late, eight, late 80s, some of those books that had come here that had um, uh, the front pages had images uh, of, of the military dictatorship in Chicago, uh, the students were asked to rip out those pages and throw them out and then the rest of the book was, was fine. Uh, because as I think some of the more recent research has, has shown, uh, a lot of the material, the content did not change all that much. Um, at, at that time. So that's just one, one example um, uh, that I, I, can, I can share with you. I don't know if Alexander wants to share anything. Uh, very, very briefly, because I've looked at the church in a, in a top-down way. And uh, basically, Iakovos, um, my approach to researching Yagovos and the junta was I was assuming he was closely identified with them. He was not. Uh, Iagovos was with himself, not with the junta. And uh, he did take the clergy laity um, um, conference to Greece in 1968, but uh, he's and so but he really saw himself as a as a person who was interacting with, uh, the colonels and the democratic, uh, the, the the Greek politicians, and when the uh, so eventually he gave up on on the colonels. So I think to a certain extent his policies, uh, he was playing along with the junta up to a point, uh, and then he uh, he did not uh, he he followed his own strategy and uh, openly broke with the junta in 1973. I mean, I don't know if that answers the question, but it, it gives the, the, the broader, it's what Iakovos was, was thinking in, at, in the archdiocese. Uh, he, he, he was not identified with the junta towards the end. Thank you so much. We have questions coming in. 
<laughs> the time though is very constrained. So I had a question for, by Antonis Piperoglu for my talk uh, and I answered uh, uh, in a written form. I can very briefly summarize. Antonis asked if uh, my material of guidebooks um, offer uh, uh, also revolutionary uh, pictures and images. And I answered that guidebooks in the beginning of the 20th century do, uh, speak more about history of America rather than history of Greek. So we don't have any revolutionary images in the guidebooks. So that's why I concentrate on poetry, drama, and, um, and school books. We have a series of questions for uh, Yorgos Anagnostou by Professor Anastasia Yanakidou and something similar by Gerasmus Katsan. Very briefly, Yorgo, I will summarize. Uh, Professor Yanakidou asks, uh, given that there is no international civitas in any political or cultural ideological sense, why is it necessary to speak about a global civic Greek identity at all? Given that there is uh, considerable diversity within Greek communities in the globe, diaspora versus Greece, European diaspora versus American, and even within these communities, whether a community has a connection to the Greek language or not, and similar other concerns. Doesn't it make more sense to talk about plural Greek identities? And then Gerasimus Katsan also asked you something similar, I think. So would you like to briefly comment on that? Uh, and we're going to have yeah, five yeah, more yeah. minutes and we're going to... Right, right. I try to be brief, though the question is vast and very important. Uh, there is no question that the Greek identities are plural. And in many ways, this is... Uh, we have been investing in promoting this idea because the dominant Greek American narrative tends to eradicate this heterogeneity. Uh, and I mentioned, I did not elaborate, but I mentioned that the narrative I'm speaking about takes place in a very, in a contested heterogeneous space of identity production. Uh, why global? Uh, I think it is, as I mentioned, I'm not theorizing a global civitas or a global um, identity, but at the same time, I think it is our, I think the next step in our conversation about the diaspora is need to start mapping out the differences and similarities across diasporas, which the nationalist narrative, again, eradicates the pluralities and speaks about one hom homogenia, which is in many ways, again, one more myth that we need to start complicating. Uh, in order to, speak about why civic identity as I describe it is important, I need to contextualize my interest in this kind of identity. And my interest is motivated uh, by the way Greek Americans have been representing themselves. And not only during the, the, in the context of the Black Lives Matter, where one heard a cacophony of narratives that were anti-Black, that were in many ways indifferent to the uh, indifferent and ignorant about the African American experience. And civic identity, if nothing else, requires historical learning. So, in many ways, we cannot, as Greek Americans, uh, go about speaking about other people in American history without really understanding how structures of oppression have privileged European Americans at the expense of African-Americans. And the example I mentioned about this narrative that consistently is hostile to racial minorities is not only limited to the Black Lives Matter uh, conversation. Throughout the 1980s, Greek Americans consistently produce a, a, a narrative that reproduces their own white privilege while it is blind to the plight of other people. So if we want to be American citizens, and if we want to be Greek American citizens, in addition to our cultural identities, whatever those cultural identities might be, in many ways we're obliged because we are participating in a political discussion that affects everyone. So we are obliged then to think about civic identities, both in Greece, both in the United States, both in Australia, and this is the ethical and the political motivation that makes me speak about global expression of um, these identities. 
Thank you, Yorgo. This was a passionate answer. Thank you. There are questions coming in, but I will stop it here. There are some questions about Febronia and the school issues. This uh, seems to um, uh, raise interest. I have questions about my material, where I find my material. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, always a um, uh, I think a good luck if, where a material can be found. So uh, I would like to uh, say thank you. Uh, thank you to all the presenters for their excellent and thought-provoking presentations. Thank you, Alexander, Nick, Saki, Dan, Kosti, April, Febronia, and Yorgo. Thank you all for such a smooth and flawless collaboration. I'm confident that our deliberations today will lead to further discussions and fertilize future research. I would like to thank one more time our sponsors who supported this conference. I will briefly mention them again. It's the Modern Greek Studies Association, uh, the Edward and Dorothy Clark Kemp Memorial Fund and the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale, the European Studies Council at Yale, and the Hellenic Studies Program at Yale. The activities of the Hellenic Studies Program are generously funded by the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Center for Hellenic Studies at Yale University. Also here, I would like to deeply, deeply thank my magic helper, Hira Jaffrey, who works silently behind the scenes to navigate any technical issues. Hira has been supporting me from the very beginning till today to prepare this conference. Thank you so much, Hira. I'm sending you a loud electronic applause. And uh, <laughs> yes. And uh, finally, uh, I'm also grateful to the big audience we had today, people from all over the United States, from Canada, Greece, Germany, England, and Australia. We have a colleague from Australia, and I cannot imagine what time is it there, are with us today. Thank you for staying with us. I hope you all enjoyed the conference day as we did. I hope to meet you all soon in person, and we gather again. The next meeting will be in person, hopefully. Be healthy, be safe, be well, and thank you so much. Goodbye. A big, a big thank you to you, Maria, and congratulations. Bravo. Thank you. Well thank done. You. Bravo. Thank you. Bravo, thank you. Bravo. Thank you to all. Thank you.